Hello. I like it. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you for coming and sorry for the delay. The reason we had the delay was there was obviously the other event going on. We wanted to wait uh, to get everybody there. <clears throat> um, this is our 15th gang prevention town hall I think we've done. We started in September. And for those of you who don't know who we are, uh, it's my partner, uh, Detective Jason Kondo. And my name is Ron Chinzer, and we work out of the Toronto Police Service. Uh, some people confuse me for a Bollywood model, and that's okay. It happens all the time. <laughs> that wasn't a joke, by the way. It's <laughs> <clears throat> but the, the reason we're here today is, uh, it's a couple reasons, but I'll kind of give you the background and the history as to how we ended up here before you today. Jason and I, we work out of the Gun and Gang Task Force. All right, so it's been around for the last 15 years. Um, this community has been impacted by the Gun and Gang Task Force in the past. <clears throat> I'm sure we've been here before at some level and done search warrants in the buildings that you live in. Some of you might have friends or kids or people that you grew up with that were arrested by us at some point. Some of you might have lost some kids or your kid might be in jail because they did something uh, gang related or was perceived gang related. <clears throat> and what we've noticed over the last 15 years in Toronto is has the problem gotten better or worse? I'll ask you here, what do you think? Better or worse? Worse. 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 Hey, tell, me, tell me about much worse. What does that mean? How has it been more? Yeah, you're right. So she said every time we watch the news, there's somebody shot, somebody dead. Yeah. You look at Toronto five years ago. <coughs> It's not the same. Sorry, give me one second. I'm just gonna shut that door. Did you mind shutting that door, please? <coughs> so I'll give you the background to where we are and I want you to know kind of the format for today is a little bit different. So I have, I have a camera and I have a microphone. It records me and me only. I don't have you guys in there. We record it for a few reasons. I don't record this for me. I don't record this for the Toronto Police Service. I record it for what's happening here. <laughs> And I'll tell you why. When we first started doing these town halls, the idea on where this, this whole thing came from was one of our deputy chiefs, and I know that sounds like a big police title, but I'll break it down for you a little bit. Imagine uh, Walmart. Everybody knows Walmart, and Walmart has a CEO. Okay, our CEO is our chief of police. Well, Walmart has a CEO, and they might have four vice presidents, and each one of these vice presidents is responsible for something different. So one vice president might be responsible for sales. One might be for... What is our logo going to look like? The other one might be, what kind of trucks do we buy? Well, in Toronto, we have four deputy chiefs. <clears throat> and in Guns and Gangs, our deputy chief who's in charge of us, his name is Jim Raymer. And Jim Raymer had come down to the Gun and Gang Task Force three years ago. And what he said was to Jason and I, he said, listen, every year for the last 15 years, we've gone out, we've done these massive raids. We do these massive projects. We go out there, we arrest hundreds of people. We seize thousands of guns and millions of dollars worth of drugs off of everybody but the problem is getting worse so we're doing a great job at what we're supposed to do but we're missing something and that missing something was and he gave us one sentence and that sentence was <clears throat> he wants us to figure out how do we get a gang member out of a gang so the idea was we arrest gang members all the time well we need to transition from arresting them to now at the same time saying well what can we do to stop this from happening again. So I'll ask you here. Uh, for those of you, you don't have to raise your hand. Oh no, you did, sorry, sir, I didn't mean to single you out. I, I saw his hand as he put it down. I feel, I feel so bad. I'm, <laughs> I did that, I'm so, I apologize. So I'll ask you here, sir, how do you get a gang member out of a gang? So I, I love that you're here, all right, because I wanna tell a story and and no, no, and this is great. And this is why like, I legitimately love that you're here because the whole purpose of this isn't for us to say to everybody, this is what the problem is here. If we knew the answer, there would be no problem. The answer doesn't come from the outside. The answer comes from the inside. I gave it to you all free. You gave me, <laughs> everything else is extra on top of this, right? Everything else is extra. I got it. So here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to paint this picture for you. All right, so you said go to the ladies. <clears throat> Anybody else? Gang member out of a gang. He said, get to the ladies, right? We're gonna analyze that. We're gonna analyze exactly that because I think, it's, I think it's much deeper than that. 
And I think, <clears throat> I think the obstacles you've had to overcome to get from there to here, I think you've oversimplified it to yourself. And I think you should be more proud of the fact that you're here today for many things. And I want to highlight those things because when we talk about gangs, it's an oversimplification. And what I mean by that is, what do gang members do? They kill each other. What else do they do? They shoot? Yeah, and what else? So, murder, shoot, drugs? What are they doing with the young ladies right now? Sorry? Trafficking? Right. Do they steal cars? Yep. Do they kidnap? Yep. Do they break into houses? Yep. Do they steal stuff from people? Do they do robberies? Do they beat people up? Do they threaten people? Do they extort people? Do they harass people? Do they have communities living in fear? Do they set a, a positive role model for kids in the communities that they live in? Do they manipulate and take advantage of kids looking for role models? But you know what we all do, including the police, is we use the term gang, and that just takes all of that and puts it in this nice little box, and everybody says that's a gang, and that's it, we're done with it. But when you open that box, there's much more inside of it, and that's what we really need to examine. So when we got asked, how do you get a gang member out of a gang? <coughs> Listen, we're not PhDs. I'm a police officer. What I know how to do is, is anybody can learn how to do it. It's not tremendously difficult. They teach you how to do it. But this is a very deep problem. Most people, when they think about these type of problems, they think about it this way. Let's look at all of the things. You can look at all the things in width, but this is a problem you have to look in depth. You have to dig deeper into the industry. You have to dig deeper into what people are and who they are and how they end up on this. Well, I'll ask you yourself, sir, when you were a kid, um, how are you, little guy? You're eight years old? How old are you? 11 years old. Sir, when you were 11 years old, what did you picture the world to be for you? Yeah. And that, the reason I bring that up, <clears throat> not even five minutes ago, you said the solution was women. And when I brought you back to the 11 year old you, does that sound like that's the solution? Well, let's, let's talk about that, all right? What are, what are they doing? What are they killing each other? So with us, we knew, I'll come right back to you in one second. <clears throat> So thus, we knew a couple things right off of the bat. The issue, as we can know now, it's much deeper than a simple question as, how do you get a gang member out of the gang? And when they ask us this question, Jay and I, for months, for months, the higher-ups in the Toronto Police called us monthly. What does the program look like? What is the answer? What is the answer? And every month, we said, we don't have an answer. Because what we did is, we couldn't come up with an answer. We talked to many people. We thought, who had the answer? Like, it can't be that simple. <coughs> and we had three things we had to look at. Or number one is, when you talk about gang, you, you, you gave a, a great, great reference point when you said, we gotta call, stop calling it gangsterism. We gotta call, stop calling it gangs. And we were the same way because what we discussed before when we talked about what happens with gangs, look at what they actually do and we oversimplify it. We just say, it's a gang, here you go. Simple, small problem, simple, small fix. It doesn't work that way. So we had to look at all the research all over the world. And we had looked at and we had called up police agencies and social agencies and children's aid and everything you could think of all over the world and we said hey does anywhere in the world does anybody have something that gets a gang member out of a gang and everybody said no nobody has anything we said all right it's not that simple nobody in the world's figured it out <clears throat> jay and i besides being tremendously good looking we're not going to fill it out either so what we ended up doing was we transitioned over and we found all these books and publications and peer-reviewed stuff from doctors and phds in the field and we found a few things that helped paint a bit of a clearer picture so when we talk about gangs you talked about reasons people join gangs, but for us, we had to look at a scope, and that scope was what do gangs actually do? And we discussed it, but all across the world, we had to find similar things that they do. And these are the similar things. It's three things. So if we have outside here, if there's a basketball court or a soccer field, and you see kids hanging out there, listen, it's no secret about this area here. There's no secret to say that there's, there's gangs here. It's known as a gang neighborhood. That's, we're not going to lie about it. We're not going to pretend that. It's not fair. Because how many of you here are actually involved in a gang right now? <clears throat> Zero. You know, we popped into this community center and the energy, as soon as you come in, that's not a gang. This is not the energy you get in a gang-impacted neighborhood. But it has this terrible reputation. Right? And that reputation, if we were out here, and you get somebody who's not familiar with the area, who doesn't know the community, who doesn't know the people, and they see kids playing at a basketball court, what are the chances? just based on what they see in the news, what they think the area is, that they're gonna say that's a bunch of gangsters. That's pretty high. 
So for the mothers in the room, single moms, just by raising hands. Single moms. Single moms in the room. Hey, raise your hands. How many kids do you have, ma'am? Two. Two children. Yourself? Three children. Yourself? Five. Five children. Yourself? Three. Three and three. Six children. Six children. Okay. I just want to paint a perspective for you. How many jobs do you have? One. One. Two. I used to have one. Two. You used to have two. One. Yourself, ma'am? How many jobs did you have or do you have? No, you. Me? Yeah. So it's difficult. And yourself? That's right. That's what <coughs> no, here we go. Listen, the, the, the picture I'm painting here is, and I'm not saying you're wrong. What I'm going to say is this. The expectation that single moms with multiple kids can manage that level of parenting is unrealistic, all right? And, and it's, that's regardless of the, it does not matter if for a single parent, regardless of mom or dad, that has two jobs and multiple kids and living in low income housing in a low equitable area where it's infested with crime and your number one concern is what is a parent in this community with your kids? What is your number one concern? Safety? Safety, safety, safety. Now when you're at work, working your second job and you have your three kids, and you haven't heard from your kid and you hear of a shooting in your neighborhood as a single mom, what does that feel like? Running. Running. Terrible. It's horrible. Yeah, but that's, that's indicative of a bigger problem. Right? The thing with gangs and this whole issue we're talking about is we want to attack it at a surface level. We want to attack what we see because it's an easy thing to do. Do you not feel that? Right? It's, it's, it sucks to hear, right? Because it's the truth is that nobody wants to take the time to dig past what's on top and actually open that door and step inside what every day looks like. How does it look like when, you know, we're reminded every day, don't, don't get me twisted, Jay and I deal with gang members and their families on a, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, some of the most impacted families, and I'm thankful for my life. I have a great life. When Jay and I start work at 5 o'clock in the morning and at 4 o'clock in the morning I get up in my car and I drive into work, and as tired as I am, as soon as I hit Rexdale, there is not one bus stop I pass where there's not somebody standing there at 4 o'clock in the morning waiting for the bus. So as much as I complain, that's, it's not about me. It's about what's, what's happening here and where do we actually find the solutions. So we'll get back to this. So when we talk about who joins gangs, initially we had this conversation and it was people looking for purpose, it's people looking for family. That's reasons why somebody might join a gang. But for us, it got deeper than that. We talked to police officers. <laughs> We talked to police officers, we talked to community members, and we tried to paint a picture and we said, okay, well, who are we looking at, all right? If we're looking at getting a gang member out of gang, we kind of know what a gang does, all right, ultimately. Empirically across the world, they deal drugs, they control the territory, and they collect debt. All the other crimes are somewhat related to that at some level or not. All right, but the second part became who joins a gang. And when we had to, to go there, and we're not gonna do it today, this is, a, this is a, <laughs> a much deeper issue than I think even we anticipated. And we usually we do an exercise here, and what I do is I go around the room, this being our 15th town hall. And if you look around this room, it's a mixed room. It's mainly uh, black and brown, and then you have a few mixed other people around here, which is great. And most of these town halls that we're in are like that. And what we do is <coughs> we go through a scenario. I'm not going to do it because we, we waited a little bit. And I ask everybody <coughs> to paint me a picture of what does a gang member look like. And we kind of play a little game. And that game is I pretend like I pull out a pill out of my pocket. I said, this pill is going to change somebody's life. We have one hour to do it. We have to go to an intersection in Toronto, and we have to find somebody. We're going to give this pill to this kid, and this kid's life's going to change, and they're a gang member. Right? And whenever we talk about it, no matter where I am in the city, no matter where we have this conversation, it's the exact same description with the exception of one time. And when we first talk about it, and I say to these people in the room, and I'll do this in communities, we'll do this with businesses, we'll do this with other government agencies, we'll do this with police officers, we do this with everybody. And the point is we do this to paint a picture. And when I say, describe to me a gang member and where do we go? City of Toronto, where's the first place do you think everybody says we gotta go? <laughs> right? <laughs> All right, so now imagine this, <clears throat> imagine this. We're <laughs> 
and I got this magic pill and we're gonna change, we're gonna change this kid's life. Okay, I want you to think about this. Guys, we have, we have 20 minutes. Oh, sorry, we have 20 minutes, we're gonna change this kid's life. We're I gotta give this pill to this kid. Or, or person, it doesn't matter. I want you to describe what that person looks like. Let's start with, is it a boy or a girl? It's a boy, how old? 14, perfect. Uh, what type of clothing? Let's talk about, is he wearing a hat? Hoodie. Hoodie. Uh, hoodie. Is it a gray hoodie? <laughs> He's got a little guy, yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? And, and I, this is, this is, <clears throat> no, this is great. And I'll tell you why, right? So we described this kid and everybody's got awesome descriptions. He's got Jordans. He's got multiple cell phones. He's wearing either tight or baggy clothing. He's got name brand stuff. And then I say to people, what's his skin color? Black. All right. This is the room you guys are in practice. A small black. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so here, here's that. So this is like, we, so we have this discussion, right? I've done this example legitimately maybe 30 times. And in every one of them, it's been the exact same description with the exception of one last week where they said it was a brown kid. Because where we were, it was brown kids. Now I'll ask you, city of Toronto, if we go out there as a police and we say everybody in black kid that matched that description. I'm going to stop him, grab him, put this pill down his life and say, gang member, I saved your life. <laughs> How many kids are in there that look like that, that have nothing to do with gangs? 99.99% of the kids in that community have nothing to do with this, but unfortunately they wear, they wear the outlook from a few people who made bad decisions. I don't even say they're bad people anymore. I, mean, I don't even say bad guys anymore. I say the people who made bad decisions, right? So the, the focus for us is we have to get out of this mindset of that every black kid who lives in, in the West or the East End that dresses and looks like that is a gang member because what happens? Do, do, do populations of the target get over-policed? It happens, right? Where, look, there's a shooting in the neighborhood. You have a, you have a, a kid shoots another kid they might both be black, and then we as the police come in and we're looking for suspects, and the suspects are black kids, and everybody gets stopped. And then what happens to that interaction to some of the black kids that we deal with? Negative. It's negative. It's, it's horrible. And here's the other part, too, is listen, we're the police, or with the exception of guys like Dale who make everything positive. Majority of the interaction you have with us, has anybody here ever called police because they had extra cake at home? And they said, oh my God, there's extra cake in the fridge. Call 911. Send the cops, send the guys with guns. No, when do people call police? Dead body, shooting, robbery, broken by. So automatically there's this negative idea when police come. Listen, we're good with that. We're not trying to break that. Our whole thing between Jay and I is never to say we're the good guys, trust us. You might like us, but you don't like the Toronto police. And that's okay. We're good with that. But the idea is we want to start to shift the mindset of not only us being law enforcement and Toronto police and all the other agencies that we work with, but the community as well to say back and forth, to say even for you, to think in this room, in this community, we had talked about it, you gave me that description. I didn't give it to you. So as much as the, the belief system is that we're doing this, I never gave that to you. I asked you, what does this kid look like? And the point of that is we're creating a bigger picture of what's actually happening. Yes, sir. <clears throat> so your example of alcoholics, only alcoholics can help alcoholics? No. If you believe in the mindset that only somebody like you can help you, you're gonna be in the exact same position you are today as you are tomorrow, as you are two weeks from now, as you are from behind. Because what you might be looking at for solutions, potentially, if you, if you even need solutions, is you're looking at people that are exactly like you. And, and that goes to something deeper. If we're looking for change, the hardest thing to do is not do today what we did yesterday. But you're here, so you're doing something right. But here, here I'll, I'll ask you this, all right? Well, let's just fly out. I, I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. What I am saying is, if we drive that narrative as adults, 
to young minds that you are who you are, regardless of what you think you can be. What is the expectation? Is this not psychological? It is and it isn't. But it is. No, it is and it isn't. Let me, before we get there, we're going to get to that point and come up. I just want to explain to you how we ended up here. So you're probably wondering why Chalk Farm, besides the obvious, all right? So with us, too, when we talked about where we're going to go and how we're going to find gang kids, it's a map of the city of Toronto, broken down to 140 neighborhoods. This was done by the city of Toronto in 2016, all right? We're, we're right over here, right over in this pocket here. You see the orange and the yellow? The city was <coughs> broken down into what's called equitable neighborhoods, and they had scoring systems put to it. And the scoring systems were based off of a few things. They wanted to know, and they looked at the demographics to say things like, what does the household look like? How much money does the household look like? How many single parents are there? How many kids are there? What is the access to economic opportunities and employment? What is the access to public transit? What is the access to well-paying jobs? And what they did is they determined that, hey, take a look here. All these yellow and orange spots, these are low equitable neighborhoods. There's 31 of them in the city of Toronto. So these are 31 neighborhoods, this being one of them, where they're not up to a par or a standard equivalent to everybody else to have some success in there. And when we looked at that, we said, all right, we're looking at these 31 neighborhoods that have nothing to do with gang crime that we know of. Then we, on our own, found all our gang crimes and where the gangs live. And if I were to take the map of where the gangs are and where the gang crimes happen and I put it over top of this, it's almost the exact same. Is that a coincidence? No, it's not. There's a deeper problem here, Elijah. <clears throat> when it comes down to actually what makes a gang member, and this is the important part for the parents, uh, those of you with kids uh, under the age of 10, anybody under the kids uh, under the age of 10? Yeah, how old? 10, 10, you got a whole team at home, right? It's a whole bunch of headaches. <laughs> They're sweet. The kids are sweet. But you got this team of kids at home and all that stuff. I'm going to paint you a picture of what happens with kids that become gang members. Because for us, again, when we have to say, how do people become gang members? It's not as simple as I woke up one day and I did it. It starts at the age of zero. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. And actually what we found again was this. You have those laminated cards in front of you, the small ones that says gang risk factors. There was a study done of gangs from all over the world. All over the world. And when they looked at the gang members, they wanted to find what are the, what are the similarities? What are the things that are the same between all of you gang members? And what they found was, all of these risk factors. I want you to take a look at that risk factor sheet. Do you see, <laughs> sorry, do you see anything on there that has to do with if they're a boy or girl, what their skin color is, what their background is, what country they come from? No, that has absolutely nothing to do with it. You know what does have to do with it? Is all of those risk factors, the more of those boxes you check off, the more likely you are to become a gang member. So that's what's part of it. So for us, we had an objective lens to say, okay, this is actually how kids become gang members. I'm gonna take you through a quick life cycle of one of the first kids that we dealt with. So Jay and I, we spent six months, we talked to 2,000 frontline police officers all over Toronto. We said, hey, these are the risk factors. If you come across a kid or a family or somebody that you suspect to be potentially gang involved and you have a relationship with them and you wanna ask them, hey, do you wanna change your life? Do you wanna to try to get some help? Can you call us? So within uh, a couple weeks, we got a phone call from one officer and he said, I got the perfect kid for you. He's 15 years old. Jason and I go to meet this kid and his story is identical to what the research says, and he is one of, of again, about 70 kids that we've dealt with over the last three years that all fit the same story. And the purpose of telling the story is to show all of the places that something could have been done and where we want to go in the future. So this kid, when he is three years old, he's the middle kid of five kids. Okay, mom is uh, 25 when she has her fifth kid. Okay, so she's 25, she's got five kids, she lives in community housing, she's a single parent. Mom says that this kid at the age of three was a pain in the butt. Right? This kid was the kid who punches things, steal things, kick things. He's just a pain in the butt. And for everybody here who's a parent, I want you to think back when your kids were three, if you have a three-year-old now, and you're inside and you're washing the dishes and you can hear them playing. Is everything okay? Yeah, it's good. What happens when you don't hear them? The mischief. We all know something's up. So then we shut off the sink. We quietly go over, we kick the door open, and they're doing something naughty. So that's this kid. He's the middle of five kids, single mom at home. She's washing the dishes. Every time she doesn't hear him, he's doing something bad. So she goes, he catches him, she yells at him, right? Here's the psychology side of it. Between the ages of zero to seven, how old are you, young lady? 
11, whoa, so you're past this stage. But between the ages of, of zero to 11, or sorry, zero to seven, our brains operate on what's called a theta wave. Well, the theta wave is it's a state of hypnosis, all of us. And in that state of hypnosis from zero to seven, we're collecting information. We don't even realize we're collecting information. When we're collecting this information. We're learning not to succeed in life, but what do I have to do to survive? There's a big difference between surviving and succeeding. So this kid learns how to survive, but he's gathering all these things. So mom says to him, every time he's a young kid and he does something naughty, mom's got four other kids. So when does this guy get his one-on-one -on -one attention with mom? When he does bad things. Then mom has to stop, come in, yell at him, picks him up, moves him. He's three, he doesn't know what's happening. But subconsciously, the mind that doesn't have thought involved in it, that makes decisions for us, is already starting to make decisions for him, saying, when I do bad things, I get what I want, which is attention. What happens to newborn babies if you don't hold them as soon as they're born? They cry, you know what else they do? They die. If you don't hold a newborn baby, it's called skin to skin, they die. It's something in us that needs to be connected. So this kid, at the age of three, he starts to show these terrible behaviors. Now all of a sudden, this kid becomes six years old, and when you're six, where do you go? You go to school. Now this kid's six years old, He's in kindergarten. Is anybody here work in a school or volunteer? You do? So six-year-old, have you ever dealt with kindergartens? So in kindergarten, <laughs> four, all right. So is it four years old now? Okay, well, let's say this kid's in grade two or grade six, right? Whatever it is, he's in that stage. <clears throat> okay, so we're gonna say grade one. This kid's six years old, he's in grade one and he's failing school. Are there kids that are in grade one that are failing? I know they say, listen, kids don't fail school, but again, there's a difference between passing and succeeding. Does he succeed? No, he passes. The same behavior he has home, does he, is he the same kid at school? And who's the replacement for mom at school? Teacher. So now this kid is naughty in class, right? Teacher stops everything, goes there, finds his kids, puts them to the side, gets them a separate teacher. Now this guy's been taken away from everybody. That's the same kid we're dealing with. Then all of a sudden, <coughs> nine years old hits, and mom says, what, at nine years old? You got too much energy, go outside. So now this kid is on his own, eight years old, nine years old, but he's out and about, he's playing outside, and he goes and he finds friends. Those friends that he finds, are they like him or not like him? Like they like him. So the same way this kid grew up from three, six, nine, the same thing of when I do something naughty, mom gives me attention. When I do something naughty at school, teacher gives me attention. Mom says, I got too much energy, get out of here. He goes outside and for the first time, now he finds people like him. Oh, now he's got this group of people, right? And then as this kid moves on something between nine and 15, he becomes 15 years old. And the biggest indicator at 15, they're gonna tell you, I'm a gang member. They're not hard to find. They're gonna, you ask them, they're gonna tell you. Even as police officers, you ask them, they're going to tell you, I am a gang member. They're proud of it. They belong to something. That group of friends they made at the age of nine that go all the way up to 15, they got a lot of bonding. They've done a lot of things together. They're very tied to it and they belong. But now he's 15, he says, I'm a gang member. And if you don't know it, just take a look on their social media. Go on their Instagram, go on their Twitter if they're on it, go on their Facebook. They're telling you, they have the t-shirt, they're throwing it out there. Well, that's this kid. And by the time we get to this kid and we're dealing with him, he's 15, he's in a police cell, we go and we talk to him. And we don't talk to him with the intent there of saying, okay, tell us everything in the back, who's given the guns. Who's, we don't, our goal is never to do that. That's not what we're here for. Our goal, again, our mission was to, how do we get a gang member out of a gang? So even, we had to learn how to do things differently. So we end up going in there, we make a relationship with this kid, we ask him about it, we said, are you a gang member? He says, yeah, and lifts up his t-shirt. He's wearing another t-shirt with the gang name on it. No problems telling us. He's not ashamed of it. He's proud of it. He's, he's very proud of it. So now he's tied to this. So then we end up talking to him, we talk to his mom, we look at his police history, and the story tells itself. And this is the story. At the age of eight or nine, when mom says go outside and play, for the first time, this kid's excited. He cannot wait to get up to go outside to go play with his friends, right? So for eight years, this kid's been a pain in his mom's butt. Now he's like, I can't wait to go outside. He'll do anything to go outside to play. He'll wake up, he'll clean, he'll brush his teeth, he'll eat his cereal, and out he goes, right? And he goes outside and he has a good time. Well, mom's like, oh, this is great. You know, but then he comes back, he tells mom, listen, all my friends have a bicycle. I would love to have a bike. And mom, she manages to get this kid a bike. An amazing day for this kid. 
He gets his bike, goes out with it the first day. He goes to the corner store, leaves his bike outside. He doesn't know what's happening. Goes inside to get candy, comes out. Where's the bike? It's gone, stolen. So he comes home. And I want you to imagine you're that mom. You, you hustled. You have five kids. This kid's been a pain in your butt from zero. You get him a bike. You, you, you skipped out on so many things. You said, I'm not going to do what I wanted to do. I'm going to get this kid this bike. Within a day, he comes back and he says, Mom, my, my bike got stolen. What do you say to him? <laughs> what do you really say? Listen, I'm, yeah, listen, yeah. Listen, I'm not going to arrest you. I don't care, but I want to know what you'd actually say. My dad, I wouldn't even be able to get the word, I, my bike got stolen. I'm done. I'm, I'm going right to the hospital. I'm crushed. Right? So this kid comes home. My mom loses it on this kid. Right? So she takes him from up here back to down here. And then they call the police. And we show up. We have a police record. And here's the thing. There is no bicycle prevention task force. It's the city of Toronto. All right? The reality is here, if your bike gets stolen, unless you find it or we find it by accident, you might not get it back. You know, we ask people all the time, if you have a bicycle now, do you know the serial number to your bike? <laughs> exactly my point. <laughs> all right, exactly my point. So this kid loses the bike. But here, here's the, here's the other perspective onto it, okay? So that bicycle, what is the value of that bike to that family? Boom, all right? Us as police officers, the, not the value of the bike, but the priority of a stolen bike. It's, it's next to zero, I'm not gonna lie, it's really down there, right? Kid gets his bike stolen in a rough neighborhood. It, it's down here. We're gonna try, we're gonna keep a lookout. For, I'm not gonna lie to you, we're gonna maybe look out for it, but realistically, right? So high value to the family, low priority for us. Mom feels bad, all right? I was, I was wrong. <laughs> I laugh at this because um, my wife, she's like, listen, I grew up in a, in not a fun environment, right? So my biggest challenge every day is uh, not turning into how I was raised or with my kids. That's my biggest obstacle is not doing what was done to me. Not all of it. There's some parts I'm like, I value it now because I think you need, uh, you need some tough skin, but I don't, <laughs> I would never do to my kids what my dad did to me. I would never do that, right? So anyways, the, the point of that story was I felt terrible for that. Well, this mom, she felt terrible for her boy. So later that week, she gets him another bike, all right? This kid rolls out again, <laughs> clueless, bike gets stolen again. Comes back home, we go through the same thing, all right? So now they've had two encounters with police, high value to the family, low priority to the, the police. And then something happens. We don't hear anything from the age of 10. Then at 11 years old, this kid goes missing. Mom calls police and says, he hasn't come home. Uh, I have four other kids. I can't leave the house to go look for this guy. I gotta work tomorrow morning. I know he's here somewhere, but I, he's gotta come home. So we go out. We asked mom, where is he? She says, oh, he's around the corner. His friends always play there, but I can't go, I'm stuck. Usually he's home, I'm a little worried. We, when we find him, what we do is when we find kids like that and they're with a group of kids, we gotta know who the kids are that they're with. Because if this guy goes missing again, we wanna be able to call the friends and say, hey, is he at your house? So we get this information, all right? But now we have a police record, it's just a missing person report. So it's nothing crazy, it's not a, it's not a criminal record. It's just a report that this kid went missing. We found him. These are the friends that he was with. So at 11, he goes missing. Then at the age of 12, he goes missing again. And this time, the police officers go in. They read that report. And they said, oh, we found him around the corner. Let's go check there before we go to the house. They find him. Same group of friends. They take him home to mom and said, oh, he was at the corner too with his friends. And then something happens at 13. And this kid goes missing for a week. We check that corner. He's not there anymore. We call the friends. Nobody's answering the phone. We look, we look at all the friends, we look at the friends, we're like, whatever, but this kid's active on social media. He calls mom and he says, listen, I'm okay. I'm just not coming home, but he never comes home for a week. And then 13, 14, 15, you have robbery offenses, you have theft offenses, you have extortion, harassment, robbery, bullying. And then by the time we got him, he was in for drug trafficking at 15. So we see the cycle of eight all the way up to 15. And at this point here, we talked to him and we're trying to, to get him motivated. And now we understand, okay, this is kind of what's happening. Well, all that stuff that happened, that's all this right here. That's all this right here. And this kid's the perfect story. Now, unfortunately with this kid, we lost him in terms of any motivation, any relationship we had with him, it's gone. We don't have it anymore. He's not interested in talking to us. He's not rude. Whenever he gets arrested, we always try to go and talk to him and he's not rude. He's not mean. He's just like, sir, I don't want to talk. We don't force it. This is all volunteer based. So we say, all right, cool, man. If you need us, call us. If not, Good luck to you. The likelihood of this kid making it to 18 right now, it's not gonna happen, all right? And, and that's scary. So with us, this is one of the first kids we dealt with. 
We said, all right, we're going to go talk to mom to see what happened. We're still learning ourselves. So we go knock on the door, mom answers the door, and we talk to mom. And this is what we end up doing with everybody. With the kids mainly that we deal with, we have a sheet, and it's just these risk factors, and there's a checkbox, and we fill it out with the kids. All right? This kid in particular, he had about 24 out of 36 risk factors. We decided to go home and talk to the mom. And as we talked to the mom, just on a whim, we, just, we didn't even think about it, we said, hey, why don't you fill out these risk factors? So she filled it out, and she had more than the kid. All right, more than the kid. So then the question became, why does the mom who had more than the kid not end up the same way that this kid ended up? It became a question for us. So we started looking at it a little bit deeper, and what we realized is mom had something called a protective factor. All right, so you can have all these risk factors, but if you can have enough protective factors or good things in your life, it can balance you out a little bit. Mom had that balance. This kid had no balance. He had nothing to take him off of this path. He had just negative things the whole time, and he bought into that. He had negative influences. So we realize the mom has more, but I want you to think about this. For those of you who, who's, who immigrated here from another country? Where did you come from? Grenada. Grenada, yes, ma'am. St. Vincent. St. Vincent. Vincent. Grenada, yes. Hi. Somalia, Somalia. Hi. And you have kids, right? Your, your kids' lives compared to yours, how are they? Spoiled? Very much, Very much right? <laughs> Spoiled. And your life compared to your parents? Spoiled. The point is, it's supposed to get easier. So when we see parents that have more risk factors than their kids, that's not surprising. The point is, as human beings and as families, is we're supposed to make it easier for our offspring. That's the way it's going to go. Listen, my kids are spoiled. I spoiled them. Their kids are going to be even more spoiled because that's the way it's supposed to be. You bang on, all right? You bang, it's attention. Listen, the, the kids that are joining these gangs, the ones that are the most violent, they are almost the easiest to influence because they're easily influenced. That's why they are who they are. They're dying for direction in life. They're dying for, and if that void doesn't get filled in the positive way, in ways that make sense to them, not the ways that make sense to us, it's the way that makes sense to them, you're gonna just die on that. We, we've had some other community meetings with <coughs> some parents of some heavily gang impacted neighborhoods, and some of the moms had said, and some of the dads had said, our kids need to get into trades, right? They need some jobs and all that stuff. And, and the question back to them was, does your kid want to do that? Like if, if your dad said to you, I want you to do this job and you don't want to do it, are you going to really want to do it? You're not going to want it. It's going to create a bigger divide. So it's everybody evolving and changing and getting more in tune and saying, hey, man, there's, I was actually, funny enough, I was, I was telling my wife last night, um, <clears throat> I was on this website and it's all these different jobs and there's all these job positions that I've never even heard of in my life. I don't even know what these jobs mean. And I looked at it and I said, what, what is this? Like, what is a, uh, a chief laundry officer? Like, what is that? I don't know. But these things exist and it's about new opportunities. <coughs> but, but this kid, <coughs> and this is the stage we're at now and this is kind of what we're bringing it into is this same 15-year-old kid, when it becomes a problem is exactly the problem that we're in right now. What the problem is, is it becomes a serious community problem when there's shootings at all times of the day when victims are popping up everywhere, when innocent people are getting shot and killed, and when we have kids shooting kids. It becomes a serious community problem. And at this stage here, who's the best person or group to answer that problem? It's the police. We're 100% the people, and we want to be the people that when there's serious community violence, that's our job, that's what we do. We, we have to go after the, the people making the bad decisions and hold accountable for what they do out of the fear of not having communities that are held hostage by violent people, kids. But if we talk about that and we look at all these risk factors and we went through that kid's life cycle and we looked at the kid's life cycle from zero <coughs> all the way up and as we go up, how many organizations does this kid deal with before he gets to 18? Family? Where does this kid live? In, in the case we had, community housing. Where does this kid go? <laughs> School. <clears throat> what happens when he's uh, out in the, in the neighborhood? You have the community. You have local businesses where he had his bike stolen from. You have TTC where maybe he'll jump on and off. You have <coughs> when he gets arrested the first time, you have the police. Then when he gets arrested and he goes to court, you have the court. Then he goes on probation, you have probation officers. You have parole officers. You have the criminal justice system where if he gets detained as an adult, he goes into actual jail. You have all these different organizations. But for us, when we really want to solve the problem, we have to realize very quick and early on, we're not the best for all of this. We're good for one part. We're good for the very last part. But in order for us to solve this problem, we can't even let it get here. 
the real solution to this isn't to do with the police. It doesn't have to do with the gang members. It comes back to how do you strengthen the family unit, right? So that mom of those five kids, there's still four other kids in that household, all right? And one of the risk factors is family gang members. So we go to that mom, and instead of saying to the kid, where can we help you? Where can we get you connected to social services within your neighborhood and try to motivate this kid who really doesn't want anything to do with us after about an hour? We decided to go to the mom. And for the moms here, has anybody come to you and asked you, what do you need help with? How much would you take to that if somebody popped up and said, what can I do for you to make this easier? For you. We're not there 24 hours a day, but moms are there, dads are there. And if we can strengthen that family unit a little bit tighter by getting them the protective factors, we've reduced the likelihood that four of the kids are gonna become gang members. We've reduced the likelihood that that kid, when he comes home, maybe those parents value spending that one-on-one -on -one time. Maybe we've made things easier for that every day by somehow getting job skills to the parents, new job opportunities, maybe figuring things out like a ride share so you don't have to get up at five in the morning to take your kid to daycare, to come back to take a bus for an hour and a half to go to your job. There's real solutions there to give more time for parents to be back with their kids and their families, especially high-risk kids. Because what is the alternative? You risk losing them to something like this, when it could be avoided if we just start changing how we think about things. And where do we invest? Where do we invest time and where do we invest money? And in what agencies do we do it and what people we do it with? The purpose of these town halls was to, it's a bigger picture for us. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> it's to give a framework of kind of what we're thinking of doing down the road. But more importantly for us, it's to find community leaders. Some of these town halls, we have groups like this. Some of them, we have 70 people. Some of them, we have four people. The number does not matter to us who's here. What matters is who is actually here. Who are the champions? So for you in this room, you're the champions for us. Going forward, when we have a rollout thing, for us, we're not, we're not stupid either. We can spend 90% of our time trying to come in as police officers, trying to develop trust. We waste too much time. We don't have time for that. There's, there's too much happening right now. We have to find the people who already have the trust. We need to step back and say, what can we do for you? How can we make this work from the inside out? We need to drive the strategies. Part of these town halls, um, I won't go through this because I think this is an experienced room, is <laughs> this is the big picture right here. The big picture right here is for us, this integrated gang prevention task force. Right now it says Toronto Police on there. The goal is Toronto Police not to be on there. The integrated has to be everybody, being all of these groups, to come in together. Most importantly, it has to be driven by the community. We can't come into your house and do this for you. You're gonna have to do it from the inside out, 100%. The goal of us is, and this is something I've noticed, <clears throat> it's just my opinion after spending, um, those are some of the partners we have, but just my opinion is, what I found is in some of the communities we go to, and not necessarily the most hard hit, the ones where they kind of have a problem, but it's one street on that corner is, <clears throat> it's different. And this is where the difference lies into play is, you don't want the government in your house. That's the truth to it. If every obstacle in your life government is trying to force feed ourselves in there to say we can do this we can do this for you without ever talking to you about it and saying how does this work on your terms we're never going to work and what we're actually doing is we're taking away the power of families to become resilient to develop leadership to understand we can drive through this together so the goal of this is never to come in and say we're going to jump in on all these things no, no 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 the goal of this is to come here talk to each individual community that we want to work with and say what's happening here that we don't know about not in terms of this house is selling drugs or that guy shooting that guy. Listen, there, there's a time and place for that. There's officers that are doing that. We don't need to do that. Our job is to find out what's happening here on a daily basis. One of the best quotes we had from a community member, which is my absolute favorite, and, and I want you to, uh, <coughs> sorry, I'll leave that. And I want you to think about this is the best quote we had. And this is the portion of the, of the town hall where we can have an open, honest discussion. I'm going to turn off the mic, I'm going to turn off the camera in, in 30 seconds, and we'll, we'll talk about openly honesty for half an hour or 40 minutes. <coughs> Some of the insights we're getting back, and I'll give you a picture of kind of what we're looking for and what's been valuable for us as Toronto Police is this. <clears throat> one of the community members in, in one very heavily gang-impacted neighborhood had said, we are not underserviced, we're poorly serviced. What are your thoughts on that? It's a fact. 
and every neighborhood we go into and we give this quote out and we explain it a little bit, I'll explain it to you. This community that we're talking about was surrounded by a ridiculous amount of social services. A ridiculous amount. And you'd think, because there's so many support services, that there'd be no problems in this community. So when we had heard this, I asked the gentleman, I said, can you elaborate on what that actually means? We're not underserviced, we're poorly serviced. Well, everybody piped up. And what everybody had said is, we have social services here that operate Monday to Friday, seven in the morning to three in the afternoon. I'm at work. When I actually need the help, nobody's here. We have social services here that can help us with, for an example, the dry cleaning. I don't need that. That is, I need job skills, I need job opportunities, I need a ride share program. This stuff is not gonna help ease up my load of my everyday. So the goal is never to look at the number of services, it's to find from the inside out. And that becomes the consultative process. So it's about talking to communities, finding out what's happening, bringing in all those different groups, and then determining where should we invest. And what we're finding is in some of these town halls, we're finding true champions in the community. And one of them, we had a, uh, and these are the, these, there's amazing people in the city. There's absolutely amazing people. I'll tell you about this one guy who's amazing. We have this, we have this town hall. He's there, he's quiet, he's listening. He's an he's a elder male and he says, um, he says, well, this is what I did for my community. And this guy on his own, zero dollars, zero cents, nothing but a vision. He ended up tutoring over the last five years over 120 kids, seven of which have graduated from university. All right, you got a guy in the community who's doing that on his own. And now he brought up and he says, I can't do it as much as I want to because I can't afford the school space. Now, I'll ask you, would you rather invest in that service that operates Monday to Friday during the day, or would you rather invest in a guy like that? That's the guy we want. So for us, it's those people that we want to find and say, wait a minute, this is a guy we got to put on a pedestal and say, look what this guy did with nothing but a thought and a vision and an idea, and he invested time into it. I don't need to come in here. We don't need to come in here and take, that's him. The goal is to put him on a pedestal and make more of him. Let him grow other people, right? So for us, it's, that's, a, that's a very valuable thing. The other thing was, or one, of, one of the other insights <coughs> was, and this is, uh, this is something we're all learning, all right? This is something we're all learning. We all being the Toronto Police Service and all higher up. So there's a reason why there's no media here, there's no chief, and there's no politicians. The first, the first town hall we did, sorry, no, but I'll, I'll, explain, I'll explain. The first town hall we did, um, we did it in Jamestown and Rexdale. Okay, the reason I did it in Jamestown and Rexdale, I, when I first started policing, I was in Rexdale, I was in Jamestown. I still know a lot of people in the community, uh, so that's like a home for me, right? So I said, man, we're gonna do this here, we're gonna start it off here, I know people, we're good. So we, we did this town hall, the chief of police, the mayor, all these news outlets called, said, we want to come, we want to come. We didn't say no because we didn't want them there. Jay and I had never run one of these before. So we said, we didn't even know how it's going to look. We don't want to embarrass ourselves, so we're going to say, don't come to this one. We're going to save it. You guys can come do it later. <clears throat> so they said, all right, all right. Well, we had this town hall. We had a meeting. We sat down and we talked to everybody, and we got amazing insights from that community. Unbelievable. We never expected to understand... Jamestown as well as, as what we thought were. And at the very end of it, what the community members who had provided us the most insight, what they said is they appreciated that this wasn't a photo opportunity and this wasn't a political campaign and that there wasn't media here because they were sick of that garbage. And we said, okay. So we maintained that. We wore suits to the first one. Afterwards, some people said, man, your suits look like they cost more than where we live. We got rid of the suits. You know, each one, every one we do, we get feedback and we change it. And every time we change it, we get better and better and it makes more and more sense. And even to this day, when we say to the chief and the mayor, they don't even ask to come because they appreciate it. Because what we do is all of the things you tell us now, they don't die here. We push it up. But we never say who we got it from. So all these things I'm telling you about, these insights that we've gained, let us be your voice. The reason why I record this and I put this on social media, again, it's not for me. I, I'm kind of tired of this. I don't want to do it anymore. The reason we do it is, it's what's happening here, how much does the rest of the world actually see it? Forget the world, how much does the rest of the city of Toronto actually see about what's happening in, in the low equity neighborhoods? 